Thank you. And my wife says I'm never home. Pfft, what does she know? Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, Teresa, thanks for asking me to come here to speak with everybody today. But uh, I want to start off with, with something that happened to me on the way in last night. I drove down from New York. Uh, basically, it's a five-hour ride. I did it in three. <laughs> and, uh, but I met a very nice state trooper along the way. <laughs> I've learned the Maryland state troopers are some of the nicest people that you'll ever meet in your whole life. So uh, he got me somewhere on 95, coming around near Baltimore. And uh, we pulled over. And by the way, you grow them real big out here. Uh, I'm looking in my mirror, and like he unfolded himself out of the car, and he walked over. Now, being from New York, we learned one thing. You get pulled over by law enforcement, you put your inside light on, you drop your windows, and you go 10 to 2 on the steering wheel. They want to see your hands, right? So there I am. He walked over, and I looked to my left, and I'm staring at his belt buckle. I said, this is not good. This is not good at all. So he kind of folded himself in half, and he said, uh, you know, I've been working radar about 10 hours today. And I've been waiting for some northerner guy to come die with them New York plates. And he's kind of drooling, you know. I just looked at him and said, I got here as fast as I can. <laughs> so that was the beginning of, beginning of my night, just so you know. Uh, so Teresa asked me to come and talk about the lithium-ion battery crisis we're going through in the city. And it's not exclusive to New York. This is going to be throughout the country. You're going to start seeing it more in the urban centers where people don't have a car. So th th this battery bike is the next best thing. OK, so th we'll get to the problems with that. But I want to introduce you to the New York City Fire Department and what our Bureau of Fire Prevention does. OK, so let's take a look. This is what the fire department looks like. We protect 302 square miles in the five boroughs of New York City, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Yes, we have an island in the city. Okay? Uh, Population is 8.5 to 9 million. Depends on what day you look at it. Uh, we run 197 engines, 143 ladder companies, five heavy rescues, one hazmat, three boats all the time. We put another four or five boats during the season, during the boating season, and 300 and spe 350 special units, special squads, tactical units, rehab, uh, ambulance. Well, the ambulance is separate, but rehab units at fires. Uh, of course, all the chiefs, every, you know, all those people that come uh, to the uh, to the party. So in 2020, we, we, we had a half a million uh, fire calls and a million and a half EMS calls. That's what the city looked like in 2020. So in, in order for me to better describe what goes on in New York City, I have a, a, a quick YouTube video I'd like to show you. And uh, through the magic of technology, which I am technically challenged, so you'll have to bear with me. We'll see if we can get that going. As you can see, I'm, I'm a big supporter and, and uh, I'm a big safety, I'm a big safety guy. Yeah, with all of that, with that, with that plate on my car and a sticker about this big that says FDNY on the back window, it didn't matter. <laughs> didn't matter. Didn't matter, it's okay. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. Yeah, we, I, I, I started a GoFundMe page so I can get home later. See if we can get sound in this. Like the rumbling of subway trains and the honking of yellow cabs, sirens, at least to New Yorkers, can practically be white noise. But those sirens represent the city's intricate network of emergency services, including the fire department of the city of New York. You know, the sun comes up every day, and we don't know what that day is going to bring. It's the largest city-run fire and emergency medical services department in the United States, operating in a city that has no shortage of challenges. One of the concerns is responding in gridlock conditions. Also, we have a lot of subterranean environments, such as the subway and under river tubes. You never know what you're going to encounter, and we try to prepare them for just about anything that they can New York City's fire department boasts prestige and pedigree as it fights more than just fire and faces challenges unique to its epitomic urban environment. The department, which serves more than 8 million residents, is one shaped and reshaped by tragedy. 
even 20 years later, the, uh, you know, the emotions that come through uh, are still pretty raw. We're always trying to train for both the events that rarely happen, as well as the everyday mundane events that are less catastrophic. Fueled by a cocktail of preparation, coordination, and bravery, the FDNY makes it safer for New Yorkers to be New Yorkers. Great Jones Street in Manhattan is home to Engine 33 and Ladder 9. First day after you start going over the rig, getting ready for the events of the day, the emergencies. This is where the lieutenant sits. We have a lot of tools up here that we use also. We have a computer that we can get special information. And we have a telephone that we can reach the 911 uh, dispatcher from. More than 17,000 people make up the ranks of the FDNY. About 10,900 firefighters across the city command a fleet of more than 400 fire trucks. The department also has more than 4,600 EMS personnel and around 2,000 civilians working in areas like administration, technology, and health services. Compared to other cities around the country, the FDNY has no competition. Chicago has around 4,900 members, and Los Angeles has just under 4,000, including civilians. Tokyo touts itself as the only city with a larger fire department, with around 18,000 members. Well, we are a large fire department. I consider us to be the best fire department. John Hodgins is the FDNY's chief of department, overseeing all fire and EMS services. My dad was a firefighter. And I would always visit the firehouses. I always thought it would be, you know, a very cool job. In my mind, the New York City firefighter, you have to have the mindset that you're doing your job, and while you're doing it, your main mission is really to help people. The FDNY operates 217 firehouses across 320 square miles of New York City. An additional 49 EMS stations play host to the department's fleet of ambulances. <coughs> Dense building material and large structures characteristic of Manhattan, along with strong winds that sweep through the city grid, forge the obstacle course New York City firefighters navigate each day. This department is unique in the fact that we have five boroughs that can almost be five different fire departments based on the residences, occupancies, commercial, mega high-rise, high-rise, subways in some areas, above ground in other areas. So based on where you're working, you may find fires not completely different, but techniques that they've learned through the years from senior firefighters and officers are passed down. And that's why as you go through each borough, certain things can change based on how they know what works best for their buildings. <laughs> New York's most obvious challenge is its most visible one, its skyline. The city is home to over a million buildings, more than 6,000 of which are considered high-rises. We have what's called a standpipe system for another building. It's a pipe that runs from the, uh, the city main all the way up to the topmost floor, and a lot of them have uh, are supplemented with a gravity tank full of water on the top. You connect hose from the engine to that system, and then we, the uh, engine firefighters carry these roll-ups up to that floor where they need to extinguish, and then we connect those roll-ups to that standpipe outlet on the floor below. The number of buildings that are more than a thousand feet tall has really grown over the last 15 years, and it uh, continues to challenge us more and more. Subways are a little bit challenging just because of how far beneath the ground they are that it's a little bit more dangerous. Not to mention the great amount of electricity that is running through the subways at all times. So there are many hazards in the subway. Moving trains, electricity, and confined spaces. Uh, behind me is a uh, subway car from MTA. They, uh, brought it in here uh, a number of years ago. It's a great asset for the New York City Fire Department. We bring the units out here and they uh, drill on a regular basis. We'll do uh, larger scale drills. We'll put mannequins in this car, simulate uh, mass casualties or some sort of fire and train. And uh, we'll have field units come out here and they'll uh, search the car, package the victims, and remove them from the train. 
To make matters worse, much of the subway is over 100 years old. Ever deteriorating conditions make the job just that much more difficult. In fact, much of the city's infrastructure is aging. Those buildings that are 100 plus years old can be like big tinder boxes and they can light real quickly. Since a lot of the infrastructure is old, we get a tremendous amount of gas leaks within the city. This can pose a tremendous danger to both the public and the firefighters going in to check on the gas leaks, shut down the gas leaks. The benefit of having something like a laser methane detector is I can detect the presence of methane from a distance. So we no longer have to put the firefighter in danger holding a meter to be actually in the environment to detect the, the presence of methane. So by sweeping the laser over the window, this window contains natural gas in it. The natural gas within the window is absorbing the infrared light that's coming off of the meter, so less of that light is coming back to the meter. The meter calculates that difference and determines the concentration based upon that. Over time, technology like this has made possible a fortified department, better equipped to handle the city's ever-evolving emergency landscape. Meanwhile, the FDNY has found strength as it's adapted to circumstance. The department has been shaped by its history and has changed in response to it, including in the span of one morning in September 2001.
In fact, FDNY oversees the entire operations for our EMS, so we're responsible for the entire city, whether it's an FDNY unit or it's a hospital unit, we supervise all of that. For a New York City firefighter, each day begins the same way, but each passing hour brings a new challenge to face or problem to solve. Growing up, I want to be a firefighter. When you grow up in and around New York, you go to New York City to be a firefighter. It's a big city. It's the uh, center of the world. The magnitude of New York's assets is matched only by the magnitude of its liabilities. New York City is the, the target of repeated attacks and repeated attempts. And we don't have to go back all the way back to 9-11. You know, with New York City as great as it is, we, we know we have to deal with that persistent threat and we continue to train and prepare and be able to respond to whatever uh, whatever's out there. The firefighters are seen as lifesavers. It's not that they need them that I guess you get the full appreciation for them, but they don't care who you are. They don't care where you live. They don't care if you even have a place to live. They'll take care of you. And if you have an emergency, they'll be there for you. If you pull a fire alarm box in the city, or you call 911, the fire department's going to respond, and they're going to be there, and they're going to help you to the best ability that they can. And very likely, save your life. Other than that, we got nothing to do. See if this works. I told you I'm technically challenged. All right. So they talked about everything in New York City in the fire department except the Bureau of Fire Prevention. We get that. We get that. We're the stuff children. We understand. All right. However, however, what we do and what you do every single day is very important. And I'm going to get back to that when I wrap up later on. So let me show you what our Fire Prevention Bureau looks like and, and what we do and how we do it. Okay, so as I come to the first slide, okay, I, I said to Teresa y yesterday afternoon, I said, how apropos to bring this group of people together in Maryland today, okay, on the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Okay, 112 years ago today, okay, at 4 o'clock, around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, the fire broke out at the Triangle Building, Triangle Shirtwaist. So for, you know, for those of you who don't know what a shirtwaist is, you know what a shirtwaist is? It's a lady's blouse. That's what they called them back then when I started. <laughs> so the fire broke out on, and went to 8, 9, and 10. Uh, most of the people, most of the uh, 100 and, uh, was it 149? Sorry, I'm looking at the number. Yeah, most of the 149, probably three quarters of them jumped. The exit locked, the exit doors were locked for fear of theft by the owners. Most of them jumped. Those who found the fire escape on the back of the building loaded it up and it came off the building and it fell to their death anyway. They thought they were getting out. Um, you could see the, the fire department was kind of limited, although they had a high pressure pumping system back then, and, and they managed to get water to the top. There was a standpipe system in there. There was so much fire going on when they pulled up, it was out of control. In, in the textile manufacturing business, okay, people are working around materials and textiles basically up to their waist. There's just piles of it everywhere, stuff hanging on racks. When the fire took off, it took off, and it was, it was smoking materials. So uh, the uh, <coughs> Chief Croker, uh, who was taught at the Pioneer a lot of stuff, was a big fire prevention guy. And he kept telling the folks at City Hall, listen, we're going to have a calamity in the city because they had the same fire across the river in Newark, New Jersey, three or four weeks before. It's going to happen here. They didn't believe him. They didn't do anything about it. And then sure enough, so soon after, within a few weeks after the fire, Chief Croker resigned. He said, I'm not doing this anymore. And Chief Kenlon took over the fire department. Uh, interestingly enough, side note, he went into business as a fire prevention consultant. And of course, after this fire, everybody was well aware, so he got a lot of work. They're still open. Croker Fire Protection is still a consulting company in New York City. They're, they're writing high-rise fire safety plans for buildings and things like that. Amazingly, his stuff kind of took. So what, what I'll ask you to do, like you did this morning for one of your past members, I think today on the anniversary of Triangle Fire, which changed a lot of codes everywhere in the country, I think we take another moment of silence for the victims of this fire and, and think and pray about how we never want this to happen again.
Thank you. Thank you for that. We had a ceremony yesterday. There's a ceremony every year in New York City. They had it yesterday instead of today. Uh, the, the actually, after this fire, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union formed up their union for better and safer uh, conditions in places like this. There were thousands of them in New York City and everywhere else. Uh, so they formed up their union. So the AFL-CIO, the parent union, they sponsor a ceremony every year at the Ash Building. We were there yesterday. I, was, I couldn't get there yesterday because I was driving down trying to beat the state troopers, right? <laughs> but my, our academy director from the Bureau, he spoke, made great remarks. And then at the very end, I watched it on video last night, and I will tell you, as long as I've been in this business, which is 48 years, there are certain things that still move me. At the very end of the speeches, <clears throat> he called and he said, Ladder Company 20, put the ladder up. And they actually put the ladder up to the window. And it, it sends a shiver down your spine when you see that, just the thought of those people trying to get out and they couldn't get out. So we teach our fire inspectors uh, in the academy is we currently have a class of 50 new inspectors in the academy. They go through a 12 week fire academy on building inspection, fire inspection codes, all that stuff. They just finished their second week. They, they, have, they still have the, 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 the thousand yard stare when they sit in the classroom. They're doing one of those, you know. But uh, we teach them, don't just look at the building, look at the people. And, we, and the first day, their very first day, we do historic large loss fires. We talk about the Rhythm Club in Natchez, Mississippi, the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Kentucky, uh, Coconut Grove, and we show them the tally of fatalities. And we tell them that's why you're here. This is why you're here, so we don't have this ever again. Okay, unfortunately, history does repeat itself right up to 2003 in West Warwick, Rhode Island, at, at the Station Nightclub. You know, when I, when I heard about the Station Nightclub fire on Monday morning, I was getting dressed to go to work. I couldn't believe that we were able to kill 1,000, uh, 100 people in a nightclub in the United States of America in the year 2003. It just blew my mind. But sure enough, history repeated itself. So, so quickly after the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Triangle Fire, sorry, right after the Triangle Fire, uh, two politicians in New York got together and they wrote a fire prevention law. That was our first prevention law. Just about a year later, March 16, 1912, the commissioner swore in 67 fire inspectors, a couple of examiners and a chief, and the next day they hit the streets in New York City. Okay. Then March 17th, the St. Patrick's Day, I'm not sure how hard they hit the streets the next day, <laughs> but they hit the streets the next day. All right. So in our, our mission statement, if you, if you, if you, if, within the FDNY, if you open up any desk computer, any desktop, you get the FDNY intranet right away, and that's a whole bunch of resources. So on the intranet is our mission statement for the Bureau. Okay, and in there, it talks about the citizens, the visits, and our first responders. We tell our firefighters when we meet with them, you're our primary customer. I mean, we're, of course, we're in it for the people, okay? but if we can make the building as safe as we can make it when the firefighters are in there under horrible conditions, then the people have a much better chance of getting out as well and surviving the fire. So part and parcel of that is we also tell our inspectors, we teach the why to the how. Okay. Could teach any of you right at this moment how to witness a five-year flow and pressure test on a standpipe system. Okay. Let the water come out, it runs clear. They remove a couple of check valves, they pressurize it. It's, it's, it's easy. Teach you how to do it in five minutes. More importantly, we teach our fire inspectors why we do it. And the first thing we tell them is, because at three o'clock in the morning, when the units are pushing down the hallway to the rear apartment, they got to get water out of that outlet on the 23rd floor to get to that family in the back. It's the why that counts. It's the why that counts. So that's us, 111 years. I don't look too bad for 111 years, do I? All right. So our bureau is staffed by an assistant chief of department as the chief of fire prevention. He has a deputy assistant chief, and he might have two someday. And then there are executive officers, administrators. There's an executive inspector. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have a team of chief inspectors that run the units. Okay, and we'll show you that. So right now our total Bureau of Fire Prevention sits when we're at full staffing at about 650 members. And a lot of people say, wow, that's a big Bureau of Fire Prevention. Who thinks that's a big Bureau of Fire Prevention? Raise your hand. It's pretty big, right? Right? It's it, in Ron's opinion, probably should be three times that size. Bureau of Fire Prevention in Tokyo, you saw the Tokyo thing, right? They got 18,000 people in the fire department, 5,000 of them are in fire prevention. That's the core value. That's the core value. They put that emphasis on prevention, public fire safety education, all of that stuff, okay? 
By the way, public fire safety education is not part of the Bureau of Fire Prevention in New York City. We have a Department of Community Affairs that works out of the commissioner's office, and they work because they go to community board meetings, they go to that kind of stuff. They also do the fire prevention safety, CPR, and all that other stuff. They don't work under the Bureau. Uh, 50, uh, 500 swarm uniform inspection personnel. When they talked about 2,000 civilians, they consider our inspectors civilians because they're not firefighters. Even though they're uniformed, they're uniformed civilian fire inspectors. They're civil service, they take a test, they, they promote up through testing and the whole bit. Uh, we have 50 officers in from operations, lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, deputies, because we have to work together okay, to make this work, to make this work. And then we have 100 I call other, but the other are as important as everybody else. You see 100 engineers, those are our plant examiners. We had electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, structural engineers, plumbing engineers. They do all our plant examination. And they're so, in these are just engineers, they're not fire people. They, do what they decided they want to work for the fire department. But they're so in tune with what we do that they'll call over an operations lieutenant or captain and say, you know, I'm looking at the set of plans. I think if there's a fire in this building and they do this, your people are going to get hurt. What do you think? And they put the heads together. So they're very in tune. Those are all our units in the Bureau. Okay, and I'm going to kind of introduce you to some of them as we go on. But that's how we broke it out, okay, because there's a lot going on. A lot going on in the city. Okay. So our technology management unit, that's our plan examination group. Okay, that's our plan examination group, and they examine plans for all the stuff that we, we worry about. Hazardous materials, uh, gas stations, paint spraying, uh, fire alarm systems. You see that number? That's not a typo. We get 20,000 fire alarm applications every year in New York City. 20,000 applications. 5,000 are brand new, and 15,000 are alterations to buildings. We need people to look at those plans, don't we? Want to be a plan examiner? Give me a call. We need people. And they look at other fire protection detection systems, etc. Okay. They have a little engineering group that looks at new building equipment. Okay. They want to put in let's, that, that unit there. It's, it's a, a chiller type unit. There's backup power. Can we put this in the building? Will it pass muster with the fire code and with what we need in that building to run that building efficiently? Okay. Our fire officers, our operation officers, they review the emergency plans that have to be submitted by law, particularly for high-rise buildings. You heard what the man said, we have 6,000 high-rises in the city. Now currently only commercial high-rises, office buildings, require someone in the building to act as a fire and life safety director. And I'll tell you how to get to that title. So we'll look for that. However, we just passed new code. Um, we're building something called a mega high-rise now. See, a 65-story building wasn't big enough. So we got a couple of 99s, but the 99s, uh, once they hit 8, 800 feet from grade, that's considered a mega high rise. So anything built 800, over 800 is a mega. We're going to require a fire and life safety director, even if it's a multiple dwelling. Right now we don't require it in any multiple dwellings. We're going to require it in a multiple dwelling because of the size of the building. The fire we had in the Bronx a year and a half ago in January, we, 17 people got killed. Did you see that on the news? Okay. Um, <coughs> that was a 22-story building or 24-story building, but without fire alarm, without public address, without anything, and the people who lived in that building came from another country where they, everything's one story. So we brought these folks over to America, and we put them in a high building 20, 20 feet, 20 stories above the ground and expected them to behave properly when a fire broke out. They didn't know what to do, didn't know what to do. So we're on a massive education campaign. But that's what these officers do. They look at these emergency plans. They go out to the high-rises to make sure that they're lined up. It's not just an exercise. We make sure it's lined up. We got a rooftop access unit. Ron, why do you have a rooftop unit? Where do firefighters spend a lot of their time? Why don't you see what the picture looks like? It's getting worse. That's a good roof. That's a good one. It's getting worse. Our new code says there has to be north-south four foot egress path to all four sides of that roof now when you're gonna put anything up. So these guys look at that on plants and they also go out and they look at stuff like the picture on the right. Okay, they wanna build a cantilevered building over old buildings. So they'll go out and look at that and say, can we still ladder the, the little buildings, the three, four story buildings underneath? So they say, you can build your cantilever, you gotta give us 25 feet above so we can ladder that building, get on there and operate. Okay, that's what rooftop does. 
<coughs> certification and testing. We, uh, goes back many, almost to the beginning, we wanted to put people in buildings who supervise fire protection and life safety systems and people who do hazardous things to be certified by the fire department. So back in the day, back in the day when I was a rookie, like 1912, right? <laughs> they said, we need people who are fit to do this. So they called it a certificate of fitness. It has nothing to do with this, all right? It has nothing to do with that. But they call, we call it a certificate of fitness. It stuck, we never changed the name of it, okay? So we issue about 70 or 80 certificates of fitness, different types. If you drive a tank truck and you deliver gasoline or fuel oil, you need a certificate of fitness in New York City to do that. If you supervise a standpipe or a sprinkler system in a commercial building, you need to be certified. We do about 80 of those. Okay. So we have a testing center. We see about 100,000 people a year for tests. They come in, it's, it's a, they sit down at a computer, they, we give them, we provide the study material, and they sit down and they take an exam and they get the certificate. It looks like a license, got your picture on it. When we go to that building for an emergency, that person is liable to ensure that everything's working right. Okay, and, that, and we, we've, issued, we've developed more new ones, newer ones that I'll talk to you about. Okay, our fire alarm inspection unit looks at everything. If anything's tied into a fire alarm system in a building, they look at it. Could be the fire pump, could be a medical gas system at a hospital. Our fire alarm people, they're out there, and all of our fire alarm inspectors are engineers. They're all engineers. Their plan examination unit that handles the 20,000 a year, they're looking for that integration of all the building systems that go on attached to that fire alarm system. Whether it's a sprinkler flow alarm, the elevator's coming down, whatever else. A fire suppression unit, uh, they witness testing and conduct inspections on sprinklers and standpipes. The code says every five years you gotta do a flow and pressure test on a standpipe or just a pressure test on a fire department connection for a sprinkler system. Okay. We witness about 12,000 tests a year because we've got 62,000 accounts. The 62,000 sprinkler and standpipe system. And then they do a basement to roof inspection. We don't just witness the test, we go look at the building and take a look around. Okay. They also assist the Bureau of Fire Investigation. Uh, in New York City, the fire marshals are our fire and arson investigators. Okay. The fire protection inspectors do that. The fire marshals do cause and origin. Okay. So the fire marshals in New York City they, once they, it's a firefighter who takes an exam for promotion. Uh, they go uh, back to school, they go to the police academy for probably six or eight weeks, and they end up, uh, they carry firearms, they make arrests and all that stuff. Okay? So we assist them as well, because they go out to investigate a fire and the sprinkler system didn't go off, or the range hood system didn't go off, they don't know what they're looking at. Why don't they know what they're looking at? Because they're firefighters, they're not fire prevention people. So they call us and we go out and assist them. We have a range hood unit. Okay. We have about 6,000 hoods in the system that we issue a permit for. In order to run your hood in your restaurant, you need an annual inspection that gives us the opportunity to come out and look at every single restaurant in the city. Okay. Bulk fuel safety. Um, every two years we do a test on the automatic foam system that would go off to put a fire out like that. The foam system failed that day. It didn't work. It's not New York City, that's why. <laughs> so they check leak and spill control, portable fire appliances, and then they're also responsible for gas stations, the power plants. Our power plants in New York City, they store 10 to 20 and 15 million gallons of fuel. Con Edison is our power company in New York City. All those power plants, they're all bulk storage terminals. Okay. And then pipelines. Okay, the young lady you introduced me before. I, by the way, I didn't realize I'd be in a room with like five Miss Americas. This is very cool. Okay. <laughs> It's like hanging out at a pageant, man. This is great. Okay. Uh, don't tell Mrs. K. I said that. <laughs> <coughs> the, ma the, main the main pipeline in the, in the country is called the Buckeye Pipeline. And it runs from Texas to Linden, New Jersey. And then from Linden, New Jersey to huge terminal Linden, it gets repumped out to terminals in New York City and to Kennedy and LaGuardia and also Newark Airport. In, in, uh, it runs underground through the whole city. Twice a year, we do a pipeline drill. Our pipeline coordinator comes out of the bureau. He sets up the drill, and it's big. It's a citywide drill because there are valves underground, under hatches, everywhere in the five boroughs. So with the dispatches, they'll say, you know, engine 68, go to the corner, walk, and don't walk, open the hatch and shut the valve. And they actually go out there and start shutting the valve down. So we have the pipeline to continue with, too. We have a hazardous cargo inspection unit. You can't run a tank truck through New York City delivering oil or gas until we look at it every year. Every year. And a rack body truck that delivers gases. We look at it every year. And we get complaints like that. 
That's usually a complaint. That's uh, that's gasoline in those in those plastic tanks with a hand pump. Could be, but it's not. It's gasoline. Um, so we, uh, when I showed this to the chief of department and the, and the executive staff in January, they wanted me to come up and kind of. This program is about eight eight months old. We've been showing it everywhere, and he said, "Come up and show it to the staff." So all the bosses are there, and I got to this picture and. and Chief Esposito, who you met in the video before, um, he said, Ron, I got a question for you. Is that one of our firehouses? Because <laughs> firefighters are very creative. They do stuff. I should have said, yeah, it's engine 45 in the Bronx, but I didn't. You know. So. Okay, so our explosive entertainment unit, years ago, years ago, they, they started out as, they were blasting inspectors. That's what we called, that's the civil service title, blasting inspector. And that's when Manhattan was being built over the last 40, 50 years. And these were the guys that were the actual blasters. They would, they would work in the tunnels and, and do blasting for 30 years. And they come to the fire department and be an inspector. Who better than the guys that did it, right? So, but they're, 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 uh, their work has changed. Okay, so I'll tell you about that. But in the meantime, they issue permits for handling storage, use transportation of explosives. They investigate illegal bulk storage of automotive airbags. Why? There's, well, an there's an explosive charge to make the airbag go off. Now, you go to a junkyard or an auto salvage yard, and they've pulled all the airbags out of 5,000 cars, and they got them stuck in a container somewhere. Is that a problem? Yeah. Could be. Could be. So they, they investigate that, and they work with the Bureau of Fire Investigation, our fire marshals, ATF, the police department, bomb squad, whoever else needs their help. They're pretty busy. Okay. So... They also supervise outdoor fireworks displays, indoor pyrotechnics, special effects, construction sites, blasting. They worked in these kind of tunnels their whole life. We're, they're blasting two new, uh, two new shafts right now out in Queens for another tunnel. Uh, indoor and outdoor concerts, fireworks shows, but this is the bulk of their work. 80% of what they're doing now is this. Okay. Uh, Blue Bloods and the FBI's are keeping them busy six days a week special effects, blowing up cars, and even the ammo to use in the blanks. And you saw that tragedy happened out in New Mexico, right? So we permit even ammo, smoke, special effects. Those guys are there six days a week. So uh, these, just these two shows are keeping them very, very busy. So what happened was in uh, <clears throat> 2018, a firefighter, Mike Davidson from Engine 69, died in the basement of that brownstone, that building that's all burned up there. That was a, a, a building that was used by many, many studios to shoot indoor sh uh, shots. It was set up as a studio. It was a sprinkler building. Our blasting powder guys went there for special effects. They wouldn't know about looking at the sprinkler valve. It's not their, it's not their purview. It's not their bailiwick. They're not fire protection inspectors. They're special effects blasting people. So they went there, issued the permit. The, the uh, special effects did not start the fire. Okay, the fire broke out in some heavy electrical equipment. You've got to figure the place is loaded with spotlights and a million cables and sound and all that. That electrical fire broke out. Davidson got trapped in the sub-basement and he passed away there. So the chief of fire prevention said, you know what? Since our blasting and explosives guys aren't familiar enough with all of that other stuff, we put two fire protection inspectors in that unit. So now they go to every TV set, movie set, special effects, indoors or outdoors, and they do the fire and life safety inspection and then tell the powder guys, now you can do your thing after they're happy. If they're not happy, they don't shoot that day. What we also did since the Davidson fire is we now give a certificate of fitness exam for supervision of a production set. So now there's somebody on the set who's in charge of fire and life safety when we're not there. Our lab inspection unit, they're all chemical engineers. Um, if you think about the number of hospitals, high schools, colleges, universities, and testing labs, not just in the city of New York, but everywhere, okay? We have a lab inspection unit, and they also take a look at bulk storage of hazardous materials. They're all chemical guys. We have 10 district offices around the city. We have 10 fire divisions. There's a DO in every division. And they handle the day-to-day, -day, the building operational stuff, the, the oil burners. The, if you have a tank 550 or bigger, you need a permit for that every year. They go back and do the annual permit inspections. Paint spraying, uh, let me see what else. Uh, refrigeration systems, emergency power, backup, micro turbines, wrecking yards, auto salvage. Uh, they go out and do that every day. Uh, spraying operations, hot work and welding, paint, that's their bread and butter. They also do 
surveillance at large block parties. It's a pretty big block party, no? A couple people showed up. Yeah. yeah. That's those big Italian feasts they have, and it's like you're dying for that sausage and pepper sandwich, and you got to get down to Manhattan, and there's 10 million people. You got so much company there, you shoulder to show. We need our people there. We're checking the propane tanks while they're cooking. You can see the police horses, the, the, bar the barricades. That's to maintain north, uh, east and west uh, roadways for ambulances, police cars, and fire trucks. Too. So they do all of that surveillance. They do. You could tell by now my, with my accent, I'm from the south, right? <laughs> yeah, from South Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. Got a high-rise unit. Needless to say, the man said we have 6,000 high-rise buildings. He wasn't lying. Okay. So they, they do an annual inspection on every high-rise building in the city. Now they have a, a subunit, a testing unit. When you apply to be a high-rise high fire and life safety director like that young man up on the screen, they go to the, first he's got to take a 50-hour class through a college or university, or there's, there's 20 places to get that class. 50 hours, it's 30 hours of fire, 20 hours of non-fire emergencies. What's a non-fire emergency in a high-rise building? Medical. Medical, what else? Violence. Violence, active shooter, right? So it's 50 hours, you get a certificate, you take a test, then you go to the fire department and say, I passed my class. Okay, sit down, take two more tests. They take the fire and they take the non-fire. Then you get your temporary certificate. Then you get a job. You're working at one New York Plaza as a fire safety director. They write a letter to the fire department saying, we have to come, what's your first name? Nicholas. The questions get harder as I go along, Nicholas. Okay, <laughs> thank you, you're a good guy. Okay. So they, said, they write us a letter, Nicholas is ready for his test because you've been studying, okay? We send an inspector to the building and he spends five to six hours with Nicholas and asks him thousands of questions. Where's this, where's that? By the way, take the elevators down, make an announcement, pull the fire alarm, make another announcement, shut off the central station, do this, do that. Then we also require what they call a BIC card, building information card. It's 14 by 17, it's laminated, has all the elevator rises, all the fire rises on there. Better memorize the BIC card too. Who's on the fire brigade? Who are the security guys? What's the name of the guy? What's his phone number? Five to six hours. When they pass that test, our chiefs in the field know when they get to that building on an emergency, Nicholas has got his act together and he's going to show them what they need to see to get that fire out. Okay. So we do on-site testing for high-rise buildings. <clears throat> our SIU, they close to them, got to a SWAT team. <laughs> they basically take stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. You know, the field calls up, we've got a sprinkler problem, we send a sprinkler guy out there. Okay. But when it doesn't fit anywhere else, our SIU response, um, Someone made a complaint that they saw a lot of cylinders across the street from City Field where the Mets play, or the way the Mets try to play. <laughs> Actually, we, we have a good relationship with the Mets. We take our probationary inspectors class to City Field for the day. They have every known fire safety thing to man, <laughs> and, and sprinkler stamp pipes, hood system, and we, they actually are, their engineers walk our, our probationary people through the building and actually show them, demonstrate everything. You, you name the type of system, they got it in City Field. So my, my academy director said, we're going to go April, whatever the date is. And I said, why? He says, well, the Mets aren't home that day. I said, if they were home, nobody would be there anyway. What's the problem? <laughs> Spoken like a true Yankee fan, right? So they go to City Field the first time, and they find 4,000 cylinders in this yard. 4,000 cylinders of propane and other flammable gases, no permits. This is kind of going through COVID. Kind of, you can you can have the outdoor eating. Remember, everybody was doing outdoor eating. We got thousands of these wooden sheds up all over the city now, and if the propane was for heaters to keep everybody warm during the winter to eat outside. So we give the guys cease and desist orders, and they get rid of everything. Two months later, we get the same phone call. Guys, back in business again. So this time, my unit, my unit chief called the fire marshals. They said, "When's the last time you made an arrest?" They said, two days ago." I said, "Come with us. We got one for you." And they locked the guy up. That's reckless endangerment. So that was that, and all this other stuff. Is the school up here? Oh yeah, the third, uh, the third uh, illegal conversions. Uh, a, a religious sect bought an old school and made it into a school. Okay, it was ready. It was already a school. They're going to make it their school. The problem is, somebody called up. A neighbor called up and said, "You know, the new school opened up Monday, and we saw like a hundred kids come in, and they had never come out." So they created a dormitory in the school, in the basement. Two means of egress to get out, two stairwells. They put up gates with locks, so at night the kids were locked in the basement so they couldn't get up into the school and wreck it and play tag. 
So we get that call, we go over there, we take the building department with us, we took the marshals with us, we took the police, took the whole gang, and they didn't want to let us in. So my guys were first in the line, and then they said, no, you can't come in here, and they turned around to the cops and said, you give it a try. We got in. We got in. And went down and we found the whole thing, shut them down, vacated the building. Vacated the building. So that's just kind of the stuff we do. Uh, we have some citywide task forces. The SIU was always up, and we have a shelter task force. Try to imagine how many homeless shelters we have in New York City. We have a task force that just does the shelters full time. Yep. And these are others that we stand up on occasion. Uh, three quarter housing. Everybody asks, what is three quarter housing? I heard of a halfway house. What's a three quarter house? Well, it's a halfway house with another quarter on it. You must know. <laughs> okay, so three quarter housing for you have uh, a group of people, men or women. Let's say they, they got out of jail, they were in jail for 15 years. They got out, they don't have a job, they have no place to live. They go to a three-quarter housing until they can get on their feet. So they call three-quarter housing. So that's that. So they're like kind of like shelters, but not. And then we have task force with other agencies, escape room task force. You have that here in Maryland? Right? Legal or illegal? See, the legal ones have emergency lighting, they have somebody on duty, they have a trained staff. But th these illegal ones pop up. I'm going to tell you something. Don't get excited. We found a, uh, not a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, uh, escape room. It was basically a, a pop-up party. Alcohol, DJ, music, in a crypt in a cemetery. An underground crypt in a cemetery in Brooklyn. How did we find out? The lone security guard's driving around and he has music coming out of one of the graves. <laughs> he didn't, they didn't even know. These, it was like they, they were able to sneak in. This is a huge cemetery. And, uh, he goes, what's that music coming? So he get out of the car, he's looking around, he's getting close. It's one of these big crypts with the building. He cracked the door, and he hit downstairs, he hears it. Doom, doom, doom. He said, this is not good. <laughs> now, he didn't go down, smart man. I wouldn't have gone down either. He called 911, he says, uh, this is John Smith from security, from cemetery. There's a party going on down the crypt. And 911 operator said, huh? <laughs> Went down there. There were 300 people down there partying in a crypt. The bar was set up, DJs playing, and they're dancing. And they were, I guess they were kind of goth people, you know, they were like, you know. But who wants to party with the Not me. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> well, we, always, we always say only in New York, but it can't be only in New York. Can't be. Wow. Can't be. Can't be. Licensed places of public assembly. They go out, they have a day team and a night team, and they switch every month so no one has to be stuck working nights. They go to all the nightclubs, all the fancy places. They work 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, liquor law is 4 o'clock in New York, so they, they can serve up until 4 a.m. So we go out to the, you move it to New York now, right? <laughs> we know where her head's at, right? Uh, so sure enough, they go out on night surveillance and occasionally they, they, gotta, they go out with the March team, multi-agency response to community hotspots. They do vacates. Uh, the law says if they're one person over on that, then they're in violation. So if it says occupancy of 300, at 3.01, place is shut and they get summonses. That's it. Done. Done. Public buildings unit inspects public buildings. I worked on that for three hours last night. How'd I do? Public buildings unit inspects public buildings. I rehearsed that for three hours. Wow. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Good Prince George's? Yeah. This isn't everybody? <laughs> Where's Teresa? Teresa here? Yeah. She told me everybody in Maryland is from Prince George's County. Is that true? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. The Prince George's Mafia. I, I know those guys. I worked with them for 25 years at the memorial. They also, we also inspect buildings that are not under our jurisdiction. So if you see the JFK, John F. Kennedy Airport. The airports in New York City are run by the New York City, New York, New Jersey Port Authority. They're a state authority. So we go to those buildings too, and we very nicely ask them to comply. Uh, CDA, CDA was stood up after the Deutsche Bank fire. In 2007, we lost two firefighters there. Deutsche Bank building was across the street from the World Trade Center, and it took tremendous damage after the collapse and fire. So in a couple of years, the owner said, you know what, we've got to take the building down. So they started taking it down, except the fact that the construction crews started to dismantle the standpipe way before they were dismantling the rest of the building. And then as they were just, just doing their demolition, they put up tons of Two by fours with plastic to, for dust control and all that stuff. That all lit up. Our guys went up, they got caught in that maze, they couldn't get out. So after that, we set up CDA. 
Any construction site is inspected every 30 days. Our CDA inspectors are also OSHA, OSHA 30 hours certified, and they give violations on OSHA stuff too. Okay. So if it's over 75 feet, we got it. If it's under, the local administrative fire company goes out and does it every 30 days. We're not going to have it again. They also assist the, the fire marshals if there's a fire on a construction site and operations if they have the need. Uh, administration and planning, they do our administration and planning. Not bad, huh? Okay. That screen on the right, which is hard for you to see, that's a picture of one of what our iPad looks. Can I lift, am I able to pick this up? May I? Okay. All our inspectors now have one of these. Okay. When they go out and do an inspection, they get up in the morning, they hit the button. That tells them where they're going for the day. All the standard forms of orders, the code, the inspection forms, everything is in there. They go out and do the inspection and they hit, I'm happy. It goes to their supervisor at headquarters, comes up on the screen. If they're happy, hit the button. It goes to billing. We do nothing for nothing, by the way. We charge for everything. Okay, when we're up to full capacity, our revenue package is $77 million a year. Okay, <clears throat> so the building goes to building. An email goes to the owner, dear owner. Your inspection was done. Here are your violations attached, by the way. You need to fix them. And despite the minor violations, your permit's ready. If you pay your bill, you can have your permit. It's pretty fair, right? All happening at once. We just went to this system. It's been piloted now for about 18 months, and I had a full head of hair when we started. Right? <laughs> Our code development people, that's all they do. We have two attorneys and two inspectors, and they just do code. That's it. Okay? And they also work on off. We have something called the standard form of order. It's a 300-page manual. Any inspector that writes a violation, they all write it exactly the same way. Okay, so if extinguishers need to be charged, it's, it's FE-206, and everybody in the city is writing FE-206. You go right into the manual, and you copy it right onto the violation. Okay? Because night. We have converted factory buildings. We call them lofts. They're now turning into apartments. Yep. So the loft thing's been around for a long time. We have a loft board to make sure it's a building guy, a fire guy, an engineer, or somebody else, and they meet once a month, and they get the new applications. But now... Since COVID, nobody's coming back to work. So the mayor thinks that we're going to turn about 30% of our high-rise office buildings into apartments. That's our next challenge. So our academy that I'm kind of tied to with the hip, uh, my job, I have, I have a two-fold job. I support the staff chiefs with policy, research, uh, uh, directives, and that kind of stuff, and I also training programs. So I work with the director of the academy uh, probably three, four days a week uh, versus five. Uh, so uh, we have a probie class of 50 inspectors in school now. They go through a 12-week program. They come out as peace officers on the other end in, in the eyes of New York State. They go on field inspection tours, out with an FTO, and on training. So they start on March 13th. They'll be ready to go in the field by themselves on Labor Day. We want to give the Bureau a whole inspector. Okay? They take a civil service test for the title. They go through school, and they're on their way. Other things we're doing at our academy, we're doing supervisors, our leadership academies. We did a code update class for 330 members. We put out a monthly operational bulletin on various subjects. Our PROTECT program is our continuing education. Any fire inspectors, working fire inspectors in the room here in the state of Maryland? Or local inspectors? One? None? No fire inspectors in the whole room? Okay. Retired, yeah. <laughs> Retired. Okay, so when, when you did inspection, did you have to go back for continuing education? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. New York City. Well, yeah, good. Good. New York, New York, you didn't come to see me. You came for the credits. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> New York City was the only inspectional force in the country that didn't require continuing education. So that changed. That changed. And then uh, that program on the computer is called the FIRES program, uh, Fire Inspection and Revenue Enhancement System. And now we're, we're partnered with the Manhattan District Attorney, and uh, they're going to present our, to our probies for the first time a human trafficking awareness program. Human trafficking in New York City is off the chart. Off the chart. It's not just sex trafficking, it's labor. So we want to give our inspectors that awareness. They go, they're in and out of factories, restaurants, kitchens, and they see a 14-year-old kid washing dishes, or they see a barcode on the neck. They're barcoding people, a QR code on an arm. They did that years ago in another country, you know, to people. Okay, chips. So we're running an awareness program so our inspectors can see it, don't take action, nothing, even if the kid says, get me out of here, ignore them. Go out, 
get a block away, call the hotline, have the police authorities go down there and check it out. So we're doing that. That's a brand new program for us now. And that's the Bureau. Any questions on, on our Bureau? No questions. It's a lot going on, man, let me tell you. Yes? Yes. Yes. Community outreach is, is, is a separate division of the fire department. We don't do any of it. We do, we do a limited education in terms of when our inspectors go to a building, they locally educate those people in that building to fire hazards by finding violations, sitting down with management. But it's not that uh, we're, we're taking the burn trailer out to a, uh, a block party or a smoke trailer and have the kids crawl through the trailer. That's all done by the public safety education group on the community affairs. Very little or none. Very little or none. Absolutely. My, Ron's opinion. Yeah. Yeah. When I came back to FDNY, I asked the chief of fire prevention, how come community, how come community fire safety education isn't under you? And he went, oh boy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been under the fire commissioner's office for, for a long, long time. Probably a little bit of a political football, I would guess. And uh, I don't have the answer to that. The answer is they're, not, they're, they're a separate group. No. I know in most places, public fire safety is, is part of the Bureau of Fire Prevention in, certain, in a lot of places. Um, I, t I mentioned Tokyo before. 5,000 people in the Bureau, 2,500 inspectors, 2,500 public fire safety educators. They take it serious. They take it serious. Yes? All right, we didn't start yet. Okay, so what, what's happening, just about the human trafficking. Uh, we, we looked at it, our training academy looked at it, then we, we brought it to the bosses, then they watched the program, and, and they all said yes. So now the assistant district attorney in Manhattan, she's going to our proby school in about eight weeks, and she's gonna deliver it to the first group of fire inspectors ever, so we didn't start yet, okay? Uh, we'll let you know. <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> let's get to the battery issue. Everybody's talking about batteries. We had a, a nice long talk last night at dinner about batteries. Uh, where, where do you hear this expert get up and talk to you later about batteries? So here's what's going on. We use the IFC Chapter 3, the International Fire Code Chapter 3, like most places, with hundreds of modifications, of course. New York City is not happy with anything that off the shelf. We have to modify it till it dies, all right? So we have modifications. Chapter 3 in the code is general precautions against fire. Uh, most recent 21, is it? What's the newest? We, we call it our 22 code, but I think the code itself is 21. It's 21. It took, a, it took a year to get through the city council. It has to be voted on by the city council to get approved. Okay. <clears throat> so section 309.3 is battery powered industrial trucks. Okay, what's an industrial truck? Battery powered industrial, industrial. what is that? Forklift, yeah, yeah. Uh, equipment and mobility devices, mobility devices. So that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. This is kind of the current bane of our existence in, in our city and in a lot of other cities. But it's not just, we just have more of it because it's more densely populated. But can you get a battery bike fire in, in a private home or in a commercial building in Maryland? Yeah, you can. You probably did already. You probably have, right? Outside. Oh, okay. Camp, campus bikes? From where I am, I counted 11. Sitting there, bike rack. Outside on a bike rack. Outside on that makes rack. me happy. In the rain. It's okay. It's outside the building. I don't care. <laughs> it's outside the building. So here's what, here's what our statistics look like in New York City. So if you look at, at the first column, the year, okay, and, and as you can see, 2022, it doubled from 2021. There are twice as many fires, uh, 22, uh, six fatalities. Uh, 161 of those 219 were structure fires. So this statistic for 2023 is as fresh as, what's today, Friday? I got that from the fire marshal's office on Wednesday. So currently, we're at 45 battery fires, 46 injuries, two fatalities, 31 of the 45 were structural. Okay. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. It's gonna get worse. So here's the thing that, in my mind, maybe, maybe you can help me with this. 
we want to go green, right? So the greenest way you can go on a bike is to use your feet. <laughs> now we got lithium ion batteries, and what are we going to do with them 10 years from now, all these batteries? I don't know. I'm just asking these questions. Nobody has any answers yet. So I'm not sure if the battery thing is green, but. In an old school building in Morris, Illinois. Why there? You're not familiar with what happened in Morris? Evidently not. <laughs> they had a hundred tons of lithium ion battery waste stored in a school building. The guy bought the building for storage, was renting it for seven hundred dollars a month. So the battery started to decay. You can do it, do it. A little bit south of Chicago, outside of the town called Ed Elwood uh parts of Exit District. They noticed that there was green smoke coming from the building. Oh, Fire chief says, hey, that's a problem. And it's now tur turned into a super fun site. Ah, there you go. Perfect. Um, they used not very much. They used 33 million gallons of water and were unable to extinguish it. Google it. More so than like lithium ion battery fire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see exactly. Exactly. Is that a problem? <laughs> so, so what are powered mobility devices? Basically anything powered by a lithium ion or other storage type battery. Okay? And they have to be, the, uh, the term does not include motor vehicles or motorcycles, anything, anything that has to be registered with the Department of Motor Vehicles. It doesn't include that. <clears throat> okay, so under this section of the code, our new 22 code, okay, uh, section one, subsection one, talks about the chargers, the battery chargers themselves, inspection, Charging areas and storage areas. Okay, so they shall be uh, charged and stored in a storage, charging, or repair facility, including sep certain areas in Group B, R2, and M occupancy. So they included. Okay, what's B? Business. Okay, R2. Okay, and M. Mercantile. There's another old term. Right? Back in the Old West, you watch the Old Western movies, we're going to the mercantile for feed, right? We're still calling it a mercantile. Some things never change. Okay. Exceptions. R3. Bless you. R3. Private homes. No jurisdiction. Okay. Here's, here's the bane of our current existence. In a multiple dwelling, you can charge up to five personal devices per dwelling unit. So let me explain why that's there. When, the code, when our people, our code development folks, wrote this up, it was two and three years ago when they were preparing to put it in front of council. And as it got through the council, the battery crisis appeared as they said, okay, we approve the new code. So we, what we, knowing what we know now, we wouldn't have had that in, in the code, but it's there, but it's there. Yeah. The other side of it is when you're in a multiple dwelling, that apartment, we don't have jurisdiction at that apartment because it's like a private, it's a private, it's your domicile. You know? Public areas, hallways, basements, like a rooftop, but we don't we don't we don't go in the apartments to do inspections anyway. So it, it's it was a good idea at the time. It's like when I when I got married, it was a good idea at the time. So. <laughs> the other exception: charging a single device in the presence of the owner while they're watching it. Okay, we could do that. So three or one is uh, they have to be charged in according with the manufacturer's instructions and the applicable listing. And there it is. Okay. So whatever the, whatever the local laws are, the state laws, whatever it is, plus it has to meet the listing. Those are the UL listings. This is what Underwriter Laboratory, they're, the, they're at the top of the chain that are doing tests on these batteries. When you buy an uh, a, a battery bike, okay, how much, you know how much a battery bike costs? Well, you can get one for 1500 mm -hmm. But 1500 to 3000 if you want the Cadillac, if you want the Escalade side model, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the battery, when that battery gets shot, a new UL good battery that comes with the bike is three hundred dollars, three hundred bucks. The knockoffs are fifty. That's the bane of that's the bane of our problem right now, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so they're not getting a UL listed battery when they buy another one. So battery inspection under three point two, okay, <clears throat> battery should not be recharged if the battery was dropped, involved in a collision, or otherwise subjected to some mechanism of damage. Okay. Damaged battery should not be reused and at the end of the usable life promptly removed and lawfully disposed of. Our sanitation department has some uh, mechanism for taking used batteries. They, they, they will take them. Okay. The charging areas. Okay. Charged in a suitable indoor room or area or outdoor, 
like we saw the bikes this morning, okay? Basically, if it's an indoor area, it's gotta have mechanical ventilation or natural ventilation in accordance with a mechanical code to prevent accumulation of flammable vapors. And my friend here will talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. So battery charging areas, adequate electrical supply. I'm gonna show you some great pictures on inadequate electrical supplies in a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Directly connected to a receptacle. Anything that they're charging for lithium ion has to be directly connected to a wall outlet. No outlet strips, no whatever you, multi-plugs. What's that, what do you call it? Search. Search, yeah, right, not directly into the wall. And I'll show you some good shots coming up, okay? So, in a battery charging area, minimum three feet should be maintained between equipment during charging operations, minimum three feet, okay? Uh-oh, what happened here? Not a problem. Okay, no extension cords, no power strips, okay? Or no other devices. So this is, we caught this on an inspection. I'll, I'll go back, we're gonna go back to that inspection again, all right? <clears throat> Batteries can't be stacked, charged in a closed cabin unless it's specifically designed for. We just approved a uh, lithium ion battery storage cabinet for charging in New York City. Um, there's a company called Cell Block. I don't sell Cell Block. I don't endorse Cell Block, but that's the name of the outfit. They seem to be first in this war. Um, our hazardous materials team is using some of their stuff, but the the, the, the material itself, uh, they're like little glass beads, and then when that battery takes off, it, they melt and they encapsulate the unit. So they built the cabinet with like you know 25 or 30 cubby holes, and you put the batteries in, and on the roof of each cubby hole is that stuff. So if that battery goes on fire, it'll drop down and encapsulate the thing. Yeah, pretty interesting technology. I could have never thought of that. I'm, work, I'm still working on shoelaces, man. It, it works. It works. Yeah. It works. So we talk about distances. You know, if the total capacity in a single fire area is less than 20 kilowatt hours, all the batteries are rated for kilowatt hours, a half a kilowatt hour, three quarters of a kilowatt, 1.2. If it's less, they can be two feet apart. If the total storage is more, three feet apart. Okay. We want to separate these. Can't use that room for anything else. Can't use the room for anything else. Uh, so on an indoor location, six or more trucks, items of industrial, or devices using a battery. One single location, it's dedicated for that. The room says battery charging room. It's gotta be dedicated. Secured from unauthorized entry, separated by a one hour, minimum one hour fire barrier, and sprinkler system, and one or more smoke detections or smoke alarms. So now the, the people who are gonna entertain the use of these devices and let them park like a school, like here. Okay, if it's not going to be out, if it's going to be outside, we're in pretty good shape. If you want to put them inside, we got to build a room. Apartment buildings, multiple dwellings, commercial buildings. If there are, not if there are, if there is a fire alarm system in the building, the smoke detection for that room gets tied in. Okay, charging areas. <clears throat> Basically, temperature controlled if it's going to get too hot, because these batteries, they heat up when they're charging. So do temperature control. Fire extinguishers, minimum 4A20BC. Minimum 4A20BC. Okay. Uh, okay, it just says they have to be quiet for storage areas, whatever we talked about. So here's a brand new, a brand new uh, place where they sell e-bikes and scooters. Okay, doesn't service or repair anything. Okay, this is the first floor occupancy. There's our guy. So he was using the battery strip, okay, contrary to the code. So what they did was we make him pull it all apart. It says the APIC, it's the authorized person in charge. Okay, I didn't make that up. Okay, took it apart and he started to plug them into their own outlets. This is a legal e-bike retailer. Okay, now in compliance, we're pretty much happy with this guy. So what's the problem? What's the problem? That, that, that looked pretty clean, it looked nice, plugged them in the wall. Okay, the problem is, Home charging using the first thing is not compatible equipment. What does iPhone tell you? Use our little cube charger for your telephone. But we all go out and buy the other ones for 16 cents and then we have a battery fire. They're not compatible. The charger and the device are not compatible and the battery. We got these pop-up charging stores with hundreds of devices and the knockoffs and the rebuilds. That's our problem right now. Okay. So I had, I had a news video, but time is running a little long. So we're gonna skip the news video, but we went out with our task force and we found a couple of places. Here's some of the stuff they found. 
This is one place. Now, this is a, this is a, a storefront in the Chinatown area of, New, of Manhattan. Okay. In, in the video, it shows that the inspectors went downstairs to the basement. There was a family of five living down there, and they had two 20-pound tanks of propane, and they were cooking in the basement of the house, in the basement of the store. And, and of course, when they're closed, they pull down the roll-down gate. So they're trapped in there. Those people, if something happens, we're not going to see them ever again. <laughs> This is what we're up against. This is what that's one of our guys. You can see his shoulder patch there. Yeah. This is this is the problem we have now. So a lot of times it's done through surveillance complaints. We find out about it. Sometimes they even it's stupid enough to advertise. They'll bring us your bikes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are, are they clueless, or are they just trying to get away with it, or do they, are they, are they you know, stupid to the facts, or does everybody not speak English as soon as you show up? All of that stuff. It's all that stuff. No, no, no. But, but they, if, there's, if there's suspicion, then the fire marshals can get those records and take a look. That started with, with clandestine drug labs like 20, 30 years ago, you know. They, they, would, they have a suspected clan lab, so they look at, the, at the, the power company and look at the bills, and they went from like 150 a month to 500 a month. Well, they, they, they're not going to draw like they're going to draw operations. Right. So this is what we're up against in New York right now. Any questions? Well, I, I got to say, Teresa, I, I, I didn't have real high hopes for coming here to see you today, but... But I will tell you, this, this was dynamite. Thank you so much for having me, and, and uh, good luck. And, and let me, before I, let me just close with this. If, give me two more minutes. Give me two more minutes, right? Because I'm going to call an audible. You're all taking a break after this, okay? We good? Got to get rid of the coffee, right? Okay. I, I said at the beginning, the work that you do is very, very important, okay? Don't ever think for one minute your efforts in public fire safety education are not important. It's very important. Okay. We, you know, we tell we tell our inspectors don't don't expect to be on a six o'clock news. You know, the firefighters they, they get the press. Mm -hmm. They come out of a massive fire. They're all filthy and all that. I, we get that, but you're not here for that. We tell them you're not here for that. You go home every day that you know you made a difference and probably saved a couple of lives just by the decisions you made. And you do that every single day. Don't let anybody ever tell you what you do is not important. It's as important as anything else that we do in the fire service. So hang in there, keep swinging because you are making a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we give nice gifts, thanks to appropriations for the state of Maryland. Yes. I can give you a mug. Um, everybody got a power pack today? Welcome to the battery life. Really? Absolutely. Really? Hey, hey, it's powerful enough that it'll actually do laptops. So good luck with that. I just I got a quick question. If I, if I get stopped on the way home to the Maryland Trooper, can I give him that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, our, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.